Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Began, and I will be introducing Dr. Davies. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Emerging, Tre Emerging Trends by Dr. Davies and hosted by The Refuge. The Refuge Healing Place is a leader in specialized trauma and addictions treatment located on a private healing 96-acre ca campus in Central Florida. Dr. Davies is the medical director at The Refuge. Dr. Davies is fellowship trained in addiction medicine and certified by the American Board of Addiction Medicine, or ASAM. He maintains appointments at Florida State University, where he regularly lectures and mentors medical students, patients, and family members on topics that he is passionate about. At the refuge, Dr. Davies is fully integrated as a key member of our exceptional team of nurses, consultant physicians, and therapists. Without further ado, I present Dr. Davies. Welcome aboard. This is Dr. Doug Davies. Uh, I'm thrilled at the, looking at the list of people that have signed up for this. Uh, some very, very impressive treatment centers around the country, and I, uh, I thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored that you elected to participate in this. So let's get rolling. Uh, what we're going to be looking at is some of the uh, research around just the basic why is it, how in the world does it happen? Because to most what I call earth people or non-addict people, addiction makes absolutely no sense. So let's look at trying to make a little sense out of things that otherwise make absolutely no sense. Look at how some of that uh, has implications for treatment of uh, patients that have these problems. And then to pull back some and look at the big picture of what co-occurring uh, disorders often accompany addiction and vice versa, uh, and a key part of understanding addiction and taking care of these patients is being deeply grounded in understanding of the traumas uh, that set people up for the kind of emotional and psychological pain that is part of that perfect storm that leads to addiction. Uh, a quick look at the ASAM definition of addiction. Uh, it's certainly a very complex brain disease. Uh, surely we're in our infancy in terms of understanding all the, the pathways and the neurotransmitters and, and how the brain works. Uh, we certainly every day see the significant behavioral characteristics. It's, it's not easy to, it's not hard, excuse me, to, to pick out uh, a person with the disease of addiction uh, once you get a feel for it. Um, nicotine, alcohol, and all drugs affect the pleasure and reward circuitry of the brain in extremely similar ways, much more in common uh, than in difference uh, among these substances. I mean, certainly on the surface of things, people addicted to these various different substances look quite different from each other on the surface, but once you dig down and... Uh, see how these things uh, hijack the, the brain, um, there's a tremendous amount of similarity. Um, so over time, continued use of whatever substance, I mean, we call it the drug of choice somehow as if we choose it, it's really a whole lot more like it chooses us based on our brain chemistry and our physiology. Uh, but certainly over time, as we continue to use these substances, they greatly alter uh, both the structure, the connections, and the uh, chemical function of the brain, dramatically affecting judgment and behavior. And then this uh, hallmark of addiction, the compulsion to get the drug, to keep using the drug, regardless of the consequences, no matter what kind of consequences rain down on the individual, true addiction or dependence, as we, we called it in the DSM-4, hallmarked by uh, continuous ongoing use despite these uh, consequences. Um, and then certainly we need to, to pull back and understand the very significant genetic factors that set people up for addiction. Um, so, brain research really took off. It was an absolutely fascinating time uh, in the 1970s when we first discovered uh, what we called the morphine receptors at that time because scientists were using radio-labeled morphine and seeing uh, 
Where does it attach in the brain? We had not a clue about endorphins or enkephalins. We had not a clue that the brain had its own completely natural analogs, if you will, of, of these substances that we had known as opioids or painkillers, so we named them the morphine receptors, and it took some time before we came around uh, and started to understand them as endorphin or enkephalin receptors, and then to understand that there's a very diverse population of uh, endorphin and enkephalin receptors as well. Um, over the next few decades, started to weave in understanding about the biological and the behavioral um, pathways in the brain, what mediates the, the hijacking of the brain and affects all these changes in behavior, um, and hopefully to, to bring that around and to start to, to bear fruition in terms of how do we take care of these people or these animals, as, as this slide shows. Animals will abuse, use, get dependent on any drug that humans will. Um, and of course, that's been uh, extremely useful in terms of uh, testing in, in laboratory settings. But that's a great way mm -hmm. if you want to tell if a human being is capable of getting addicted to it. If you can get an animal to self-administer, and they can, it, it can be ridiculously easy to train uh, and get an animal to self-administer a drug if it is rewarding, if it is addicting. Um, on the other hand, very difficult, probably impossible, to teach an animal to self-administer insulin or beta blockers or antibiotics. Um, it's got to be a rewarding drug. So certainly the, the evidence is that addiction is a biologically based disease of the brain and, and as not so long ago we had the, uh, the decade of, of the brain, this really came to the forefront. Um, what you can notice on this slide, this is a, a PET scan or positron emission tomograph and the way you, you read these things is the areas that are red and I'm pointing those out, are actually, they show the highest level of glucose utilization. Um, so what's been done is a, is a specially uh, rigged glucose molecule with a little bit of radioactive uh, fluorine has been put on it. So the uh, highest areas of activity are red, the yellow areas are the less active areas, and then the blue areas are the least active of all. So of course these are the uh, uh, correspond with some of the ventricular structures in the brain which would not have uh, blood flow to them, so you wouldn't expect to see tracer in those areas. But this is a normal brain in a resting individual, and then this brain, by contrast, uh, by a cocaine user, and you see much less uh, activation. Uh, the cocaine is in interfering with the brain's ability to utilize glucose and interfering with the ability to uh, um, to function properly. And then you can see on this uh, other area of the slide, these are all sections, different sections through a normal brain. Somebody who's uh, uh, 10 days uh, out from using cocaine, you see there's great disturbances, much decreased activity uh, in the brain, and then with time, it does heal, it does reset. So 100 days out, uh, you see some return of function. So the brain of, of someone that is an addict is, uh, is an extremely changed brain, and, and I might argue that it's changed, it's different from birth. It's changed even before, it is different even before exposure uh, to the chemical in some very fundamental ways, uh, including what, uh, what genes the, the universe has seen fit to, uh, to open up and then allow to be expressed in that individual's brain and therefore to determine how they respond to various cues in the environment. Um, if from birth you've been wired and set up with a brain for, set for addiction, then once the brain becomes exposed to the chemicals, you see unleash the uncontrollable and uh, compulsive use of the substance. So this sort of meant to be tongue-in-cheek. This came off the Onion website, which is a uh, 
a, a satirical uh, look at the news, but it's really not so far off, um, particularly when you consider how extremely uh, rewarding uh, many foods are, particularly salty, particularly sweet, particularly fat-laden foods, uh, extremely rewarding to the brain, will cause uh, dopamine release, not unlike uh, chemicals. So this, this uh, headline here is really not that far off the mark. So uh, going back to uh, comparing a brain scan, and you can quite easily see the differences here, just to summarize, the prolonged use of the drug definitely changes the brain in extremely powerful and fundamental ways, and these changes go on for, can go on for an extremely long time. And patients ask me this all the time, Doc, once I stop using, you know, how quickly is my, my brain going to reset? And I, I share with them right from the outset some, uh, you know, some hope that it will reset, that things will get much, much better, um, but that you can't say for sure, obviously, how many days, weeks, or months it will take for, uh, for the drug use to reset, but you can certainly share the, minute, the message that the, the sooner you stop using, the, the sooner we get out of the universe's way, the sooner our brains start to heal and reset, uh, center themselves, and get grounded, and that's absolutely built into the brain to do that for, for every individual. So that's the good news. So addiction, absolutely a brain disease beyond any kind of reasonable doubt, needs to be understood, uh, according to NIDA, the National Institute for Drug Abuse, as a chronic recurring illness. And I might add chronic recurring progressive illness, sometimes fatal illness, that absolutely requires and deserves treatment, just like so many other chronic uh, recurring illnesses that we see in uh, primary medical practice. So many of the changes that end up occurring certainly are a, uh, in response to the positive re reinforcement, the, the dopamine release that all addictive substances um, uh, are capable of, of doing in the brain. And the fact of the matter is, and I, I had the good fortune to hear Dr. Nora Volkow uh, talking at a, a Grand Rounds at the University of Florida, that the brain, bottom line, she broke it down just like this, the brain uses pleasure to ensure our survival. So these very critical uh, pathways known by a lot of different names, the reward pathway, the pleasure pathway, these are truly the central uh, drive mechanisms for behavior and for action in our brain. And just one name for uh, referring to this region is the mesocorticolimbic pathway. So here's basically the way the reward system is, is set up. Um, the idea is that these basic, very basic behaviors yield a release, small pulses of dopamine in these critical um, areas in what has sort of been come to be known as the the reptile brain. We're talking the most primitive, the most powerful regions of the brain, and um, they're all about survival. That's absolutely their main concern. Um, and the way pulses of dopamine and hence pleasure are mediated in this area in the brain is by either taking on food, taking on water, experiencing sex and nurturing. All of those things cause dopamine release in this critical area in the brain. And when you think about it, all these things are tightly um, interwoven into our relationships. And you'll hear in the rooms of recovery all the time, people talking about their lives becoming unmanageable. This is how the unmanageability creeps in, is because our relationships fall apart because job one is no longer for the addicted brain to obtain food, water, sex, and nurturing. Job one every day becomes obtaining enough of whatever our substance of choice is. Um, so it's not to say somebody active in their addiction doesn't still consume a little food and water. Um, and those are incredibly important things. I mean, they keep the individual alive sex and nurturing keeps the entire race on the planet, so that's why these are such critical areas 
in the brain and given so much weight and so much power, but as these things sort of spin out and get put on the back burner, our relationships fall apart. And you can you can understand what could be more loving than somebody preparing food for you or you preparing a meal for somebody. Um, sex you can do on your own outside of a relationship, but it certainly pales in comparison to uh, when done in the context of a relationship. And by definition, nurturing involves another being, another person. So this is all about how unmanageability creeps into uh, our addiction. And also the exact same reason why addicts can't just quit. You didn't think your way into addiction. You certainly cannot think your way out of it. Uh, a look at some of the uh, anatomy um, in drug abuse. These are the, the basic circuits, the uh, reward and salient circuits here. And salient is a, is a fascinating uh, topic. It has to do with what things are salient in the brain, what things uh, grab your attention. Um, for instance, you may have just completed a, a very large satisfying meal, but I, I defy you to walk out of the restaurant and still not be scoping out and checking out what's on other plates or if there's a dessert cart set up at the door, that's going to be salient. It's going to catch your attention. You're at least going to take a look at it as you sail on by. Um, whether or not you actually uh, make a decision to go after any of the uh, things that you're seeing that are spiking some salience because in the past they've elicited rewards in your brain has to do with these motivational and drive centers up in the frontal area of the brain. <clears throat> now, where we make our executive decisions about, for instance, once we see something rewarding and decide it might be interesting to uh, consume that item or mate with it or hug it or have a conversation with it brings in the prefrontal cortex uh, and these areas in the control center where we make an executive decision about this is sort of the go no go center of the brain and this would be something uh, you know appropriate for me to gauge in or no I better lay off and back off of this thing um, the memory and learning centers, of course, that record all our experiences in our life as we go along regarding what was, regor uh, what was rewarding, um, what things we went after, and that worked out well for us, what things we elected to stay away from, and that worked in our favor. Uh, all these uh, brain centers work together to determine our, uh, our behaviors. And all of these things must certainly be considered uh, in trying to help a brain reheal and uh, reset the kind of behaviors you're going to see as you take care of uh, people with addiction. Um, so here's basically how the reward pathway gets hijacked. You will recall I said there were all those natural uh, things that spark reward in the brain like food like water, like sex, like nurturing, cause small pulses of dopamine in those critical brain areas. If you are from birth a person that's been wired and set up to experience addiction, that means that there are certain substances out there in the world that you can put into your brain that will elicit a flood of dopamine, way greater uh, than the best food, the best drink, the best sex, or holding your newborn child uh, in the operating room. Um, after their birth. All these things just get completely eclipsed uh, by the pulses of dopamine that the, the addicted person receives in their brain from their drug of choice, at least in the beginning. And that's part of the cruel hoax of addiction, that it never, those initial experiences, uh, those initial rewards are not maintained and the individual then spends the rest of their lives chasing, uh, chasing that drag and chasing that reward that was present in the beginning. And after chronic use, kind of nothing works anymore. After chronic use many years, you can have a swimming pool full of your drug of choice and it just doesn't work anymore. Um, 
drugs might be used to, to alleviate some pain and get you out of the misery of the withdrawal and, and on a good day uh, maybe make you feel normal, but certainly doesn't lead to the intense pleasures that uh, happened on the first couple of exposures to the drug. So addiction is certainly a multifactorial disease. It's a, it's a perfect storm. I tell my patients that need to come together to create this thing. First of all, the, the body uh, or the, the brain, you need to be born with a, a brain that is set up and wired and capable of responding to the drug. If you don't have a brain that, that gives you a ferocious dopamine release when you put that drug in your brain, you're not going to understand what all the fuss is about. You're not going to understand why people turn their lives upside down for that drug experience because you do not have that drug experience. In fact, all an earth person, as they call them, might experience is side effects when they put the medication in their body. Also part of the perfect storm uh, is that uh, there's some kind of psychological or emotional pain that the individual is in. Um, that psychological, emotional pain lives in their, their mind, and when you combine that with a spiritual disconnect, um, a very different worldview to, to feel that you're on the surface of a planning, uncaring planet whirling around in space versus you're connected with everything. You're connected to everyone. That's a very different uh, worldview and a, a a very leads a very different uh, feeling in the individual, and all these things come together to, to create addiction. Uh, whereas what normally gets all the attention is just the addictive behavior, the smoking, the drinking, the drugging, or if you've got a process addiction, the, the gambling, the sexing, the 60% of the country eats way beyond their nutritional needs. The, the, so, you know, the eating, the disordered eating, that's what gets all the attention, but that's not the meat and potatoes. That's not the real business end of the iceberg. This is the part of the iceberg that ripped open the hull of the Titanic and sent her to the bottom, not this little bit of fluff up the top. So this is where our efforts really, and our understanding, and our love really needs to be focused down in these areas. Treatment absolutely works. If we give it a chance, it absolutely works. So here's just looking at the brain scan and, and watching the brain heal from the uh, not yet uh, addicted brain into, as you can see, a, a radical change um, in activity uh, in the actively addicted uh, with the, excuse me, with the initial use of drug, there actually is a huge, those huge pulses of dopamine and I, I don't try to argue with anybody and say that drugs don't feel absolutely amazing in the beginning, but here's what always follows if you're somebody, particularly somebody whose brain is wired and set up for addiction. There's absolutely a diminution of, of function here. Um, if red feels good and you've got this much red when you start and you wind up with that little amount of red, that's not a good situation. But the good news is with therapy, with healing, with effective treatment, you can, uh, I guess as the Beatles used to sing, get back, get back to where you once belonged. So what does, uh, how can science inform us in terms of our approach to, to treating addiction? And if you look at break healing down into some stages, it certainly has to start uh, with detoxification and treatment move on to recovery, and then hopefully if the individual is to, to thrive long term to maintain their recovery and have some peace and serenity in their lives, which I think is all that any of us on the surface of the planet are looking for, then self-discovery is our real goal. So um, breaking down that, that first stage, the treatment approach, um, when we're initially presented with a patient, of course, the first thing we need to do is, is assess them and get a grip on, on what has been going on in their lives and what's going on uh, for them right then and there as they're, they're sitting in front of you. So critical to assess the um, extent of the disease and the severity of, 
of their addiction, whatever that is, once again, whether it's uh, chemical use or whether it's a process addiction. Um, we see an awful lot of sex addiction, eating disorders, gambling addiction, video game addiction, um, and, and some of our therapists uh, even look at the mood states, uh, depression uh, as being something that people can, can get, uh, if you will, addicted to. Also absolutely critical to assess people for any uh, co-occurring or comorbid psychiatric disorders um, and ultimately leading to uh, making a distinction between whatever co-occurring disorder they appear to have, depression, uh, you, you can have stuff that looks just like bipolar affective disorder, you can have the, some of the most psychotic behavior you'd ever want to not see, and the big question is, is all this strictly substance-induced, or is it a uh, freestanding disorder that, that predated the addiction and, and therefore probably needs to be handled uh, with a different strategy? So once we make our assessment, uh, of course our goal all, always is to, to comfort and to, to stabilize people. It certainly begins with basically uh, getting the person to, to stop poisoning themselves, and sometimes people are quite agreeable to this, and in other times it, it requires a, a locked facility to, to separate them from uh, their drug of choice in the beginning, and depending on the substance, um, certainly detoxification needs to be uh, considered. Um, I, I certainly don't think twice about detoxing people that people that come in with uh, opioid issues. Um, it's extremely uncomfortable. I mean, John Lennon didn't write the song Cold Turkey for, for no reason. It's, it's miserable. Uh, in general, we look at it as not terribly life-threatening to come off of opioids, although certainly if you've got uh, coronary artery disease, uh, you've got a berry aneurysm in your brain, and you don't have a lot of physiologic reserve, then the, the tachycardia, um, and the hypertension might not be well tolerated and could result in a, in a lot of uh, morbidity or, or even a lethal outcome for somebody going through uh, opioid withdrawal. The uh, emesis from alcohol withdrawal could potentially be a fatal thing in somebody who's got uh, uh, horrific uh, uh, gastritis um, or, uh, or a disease in the venous system around the liver. So certainly detoxification needs to be undertaken. Of course, we also provide detoxification with some kind of a GABAergic or GABA-active substance. And anybody who's come in dependent on GABA-related um, addictions, such as alcohol dependence or benzodiazepine dependence. So those people also uh, richly deserve and need detoxification. Uh, people coming in with uh, psychostimulant abuse generally not requiring a lot in the way of uh, medical support or detoxification, but sometimes their, their mood states um, are so bad, they're so dopamine deficient that there's um, actually an increase in suicidal thinking, and in that case, um, that kind of individual might need a, either a, a more secure environment or uh, some medication support uh, early on when they first come to you uh, in the assessment and stabilization period. We certainly need to, to set them up with whatever sort of acute care uh, they need. The, the pharmaceutical, you know, largely concerned with detoxification, but also need to take a look at whatever uh, primary, ongoing, chronic uh, medical problems that they may present with those, all of those issues still need to be, uh, you know, thought about and cared for because the, the classic situation is the person has been neglecting issues um, while they've been busy uh, being of service to their addiction. So you've got all those medical issues still to look at. Psychosocial needs, for heaven's sake, people never or rarely uh, come in without having wreaked a lot of havoc on a lot of family members. So there's going to be a whole social milieu of, of other people out there that love and care for the person that you're trying to take care 
care of, and they're uh, all going to have uh, needs that uh, that deserve to be uh, addressed, and, and they've got their own healing to do as well. Um, and then certainly any uh, co-occurring psychiatric or medical disorders need to be addressed. So in the recovery stage, once we get somebody um, reasonably well enough through the detoxification stage, it's time to start weaving them um, into treatment, um, supplying whatever support services might be uh, required, and we'll be looking at a, a couple of case examples here and going over some examples of that, um, and certainly starting to introduce people to the principles of recovery. Um, because so often, even though, remember, all this energy is being focused on that little tip of the iceberg, the drinking, the drugging, the smoking, the snorting, the injecting, the whatever, we think that's what the problem is. And if we could just stop using, everything else would take care of itself. And of course, nothing else could be further than the truth because the using is in part is flowing from all those other issues and all those other problems. So it's it's a critically important to get people to to start to understand, you know what, the using, whatever you've been using, that's just a symptom. That's not your problem. We're going to help you with it. We're going to take care of it. We're going to pay some attention to it. But it's not the main deal. It's not the problem. The problem goes way deeper than that. And, and the principles of recovery, either through the, the 12 step uh, base, which of course we uh, use a, a great deal um, here at the refuge, can go a long, long way to start to, to shift the person and set them up for some real meaningful change in the way they look at the world and the way they look at themselves. So uh, once we, we get somebody through treatment, it's, it's real world time. Um, and, and in order to best lock down the disease of addiction, being that it is chronic and progressive, progressive particularly if you don't take care of it, but even if you take care of it, it can progress. It's very important to get people launched on this self-discovery pathway to get them uh, mm -hmm. to transition over to self-care, caring for themselves because they're going to be not in the, the treatment center, not in the treatment milieu anymore. And, and for some people, that's a, that's a huge shift. Um, some people absolutely thrive in treatment and don't do so well in the real world. So transitioning to, to self-care and, and setting the person up for success in this realm is extremely important. Um, meditation is a, is a, for instance, way of curing, if you will, at least uh, mediating and, and greatly reducing the mental and psychological discomfort that so many of our patients are in. And we'll come back and, and look at that in a little bit. And just taking a much more uh, holistic view of the person in the world, how they relate, how they look at themselves, how they look at other people. Um, and we'll come back to that also. Self-discovery, probably a, a uh, run, running much deeper than recovery and a much better term to describe it. Uh, when we go through effective treatment, it's not like we recover back, go back to what we were like before we picked up and started using. Um, it goes way, way beyond that um, to self-discovery and to affecting some, some real change and some real uh, shifts in the person's experiences. Uh, this is a quote from, uh, from an Indian sage, Nisargadatta, that says, wisdom tells me I'm nothing, love tells me I'm everything, and between these two, my life flows. Um, we need to, to set people up and, and help our patients be be comfortable with this and, and understanding, uh, you know, the ping-ponging and feelings that happen is they can be tolerated and they don't have to be answered with a, with a drug uh, or a smoke and an immediate pulse of, of dopamine to try to 
to relieve uh, life's basic discomforts as they as they keep coming. So a critical part of addictions treatment, setting people up for success, is the prevention of relapse. Um, I, I share with patients that you're always going to have deep down in that very primitive, very powerful, you can't argue it with it center of your brain, it's always going to be uh, potentially very sensitive to whatever your drug of choice was. That part of the equation doesn't go away. Now, I, I try to share with people what does heal is the intense discomfort you have when you're in a withdrawal state, or for that matter, when you're continuously using for a period of time. Um, that heals, that resets. When you stop introducing the external poisons, the external drugs, or the external behaviors in terms of a process addiction, uh, the, the neurotransmitters that those external compounds have been replacing and have been short-circuiting, those neurotransmitters repopulate themselves. Uh, the, the cells in the brain that host the receptors that those that our drugs of choice keyed into, and that of course those very critical, very naturally rewarding neurotransmitters, um, such as dopamine, epinef uh, norepinephrine, um, all those things key into, all those heal and reset and repopulate themselves. But you've got to continue to work that recovery program so that the, the deep pain, the deep anguish goes away and doesn't come back. When you get rid of the day in, day out uh, horrible messages that, that our patients so often feed themselves, when you get rid of that kind of pain, you no longer need to medicate the pain. When the pain is gone, you don't need to medicate it with opioids every day or with alcohol every day or with THC every day or with tobacco every day. So here's a first case example. Uh, this was a 41-year-old uh, uh, male uh, physician who had recently uh, been intervened on at work and it was revealed uh, that there was about 10 years of opioid use in this individual. Um, so, going back to the, the schema we had of first, you want to assess the individual. So, the extent and the severity of disease in somebody who's been using opioids for 10 years is, uh, is uh, quite deep. We're certainly not looking at a light case of addiction here. Um, you have to look at uh, co-occurring disorders. Um, and to assess uh, in terms of uh, mental status in this individual, they uh, denied any real depression or um, bipolar thought patterns, no, um, no psychotic uh, ideation. Uh, but when closely questioned, the person said, you know what, if I just don't wake up tomorrow, that would be okay. Um, so certainly picking up on some depression in that individual, uh, but as it turned out, uh, purely substance-induced depression, which uh, got much better actually within the um, two or three months, actually four months that this person was in, in treatment, the depression uh, started to, to fade and lift. Um, going on through stabilization, certainly detoxification uh, necessary in, in somebody using uh, opioids for 10 years, mostly for compassionate and humane reasons, but also to, you know, help get the person to, to buy into treatment, that we care about you. It's not about suffering. We're going to get you through this comfortably. Um, we're going to get you through this safely is the, is the message we need to send to our patients. Um, and in certainly a, a non-judgmental fashion. Uh, going on to uh, uh, acute care, um, psychosocially, the person was in the, the throes of a rather messy divorce. Uh, you know, there were children involved, so there's a lot of, uh, of hurt people out there that could use some uh, education and some reassurance um, that their loved one is going to be okay, is going to do all right. 
uh, onto the recovery phase, uh, certainly uh, treatment necessary. Um, when you consider the, the professional status of the person, I mean, just to maintain their license treatment, uh, normally being required uh, by a state board of medicine. There's other professionals like airline pilots. You might be, uh, there might be more of a federal mandate to, to treatment. Um, but the interesting thing about <clears throat> these groups is that they have exceptionally good uh, recovery rates because they wind up having the privilege of <clears throat> exceptionally good treatment and they have exceptionally huge egos and, and could not face the possibility of losing uh, the big ticket to who they think they are, what they think they are. If you tell an airline pilot he's never going to get back into the cockpit of his 747, that's, that's a powerful tool to, to use to encourage somebody to buy into treatment early on when when they may not, uh, when there st still may be some denial and, and they don't understand the the need for, for treatment, but very good recovery rate in these groups um, because they do get good treatment and treatment really does work. Uh, the self-discovery path, uh, not so much did this person get into meditation, but discovered meditation in motion and says yoga actually is the thing that, that saved his life and, and had an epiphany when a couple years into recovery uh, discovered that uh, going to yoga classes actually made him feel way better than opioids ever did and it occurred to him if he had some of his drug of choice uh, it would have loused up how good he felt after his hot yoga class. And if you haven't figured it out yet, this is basically my story. Case number two is actually sort of a composite of uh, patients we see at the, the refuge, 26-year-old uh, female injection use so you have to consider that in terms of extent and severity of disease uh, and the support services uh, needed to, to scan for uh, hepatitis C, HIV, uh, you know, potentially bacterial endocarditis, all the things that can go along with injection use. Also a comorbid user of THC and tobacco. This person came from a state where marijuana is legal, so they don't really even perceive it as a drug and tobacco. People just tend to totally carve out of their their recovery sense or their recovery program uh, altogether, despite the fact that tobacco is the, the absolutely deadliest drug on the planet that our patients use, and that it's every bit as addictive as heroin, cocaine, alcohol, any drug you want to stack it up against. This person came in with some some other uh, issues, and I she's experiences non-suicidal self-harm, and classically this is in the form of a cutter, but this patient actually uh, preferred to, to put needles into her veins and just watch the blood uh, drain out, um, and also eating disorder in this person. So a whole lot of different uh, items that need to be looked at in terms of holistic and effective meaningful care for this patient. So summarize. Addiction is certainly a very complex brain disease. Lots of behavioral uh, characteristics. We're still not at a point where we can, uh, you know, do scans on a clinical basis. So it's all looking at behavior. Um, the brain, basically, the most critical and powerful centers in the brain end up getting hijacked, and that's why we see the behavioral changes. And the brain is absolutely, fundamentally, probably from birth, different from somebody who's, uh, I call an earth person, somebody who's not set up for addiction, but certainly radically different once they've been exposed to the drugs um, for any period of time. Uh, and that's basically the, the information I wanted to, to share with you. I certainly uh, deeply appreciate the, the people from all the, the very uh, impressive centers around the country that have signed in on this. Um, if my uh, handlers or caretakers have received any questions from the audience, I'd certainly be happy to address those at this time. All right, so uh, Glenn Murray's piped in with a good question about uh, does the brain scan differently with uh, 
cannabis products uh, versus cocaine. And if what you're doing is one of those scans, uh, like I showed initially, looking at glu glucose utilization, um, you'll certainly see some different um, areas of, of the brain affected differentially. So I, mentioned, I imagine, you know, there would be some difference in the scans, but then there would also be uh, a lot of similarities in terms of uh, big areas of, uh, of hypofunction in the brain. Certainly up at the surface of things, there's some fascinating differences between uh, THC. Uh, relatively recently, uh, it's been discovered the whole reason people smoke marijuana, and that kind of sounds like the lead into a joke, but unfortunately I don't have a good joke to go with that. Um, where I was headed with that is that uh, there is a natural THC-like compound in the brain called anandamide, which uh, I'm thinking was discovered by a, uh, some kind of an Indian um, marijuana-loving individual because he named it anandamide or she named it anandamide, and an ananda is a Hindu word that means bliss. So, so he sees as the brain's internal bliss chemical uh, is what uh, delta-9 THC in the plant is, is replicating and the whole reason that those of us that like to smoke weed do it, uh, whereas cocaine... Uh, is more of a direct uh, dopamine um, release or dopamine uh, affecting type compound. Um, Elizabeth Ossip uh, put in a, a very good question about process addictions. Um, is it you know same or similar brain change? I think it's probably shares much more in common um, than it is differently. Certainly, when you go at it from a behavioral level, people do the same crazy unmanageability type life actions um, if they're quote unquote merely engaged in a process addiction as people do uh, when they're wrapped up in a chemical dependence. Um, also some questions about the effects of trauma in the brain. There's, there's some fascinating um, um, work there as, as well um, looking at the similarities. Um, there's been animal research done. Of course, you can't can't section a, a human brain as as freely or as easily as you you can an animal. But so we do know from animal studies that the the brain of a uh, cocaine using individual looks ridiculously similar to the brain of someone that's been repeatedly traumatized. The uh, nerves that, uh, that create and are the factories, if you will, for the dopamine, that critical neurotransmitter that, that gives us that sense of serenity and peace and well-being and life is worth living, that's the chemical, uh, the dopamine is the chemical that gets depleted in the brain of the chronic cocaine addict. The cells are shrunken, the, the pathways that transport tyrosine hydroxylase down to the nerve terminals where the dopamine is actually built from the tyrosine hydroxylase, all those things are depleted and shrunken. And uh, when they studied the, the brains, at least of monkeys that had been uh, traumatized uh, by other members of the monkey troop, you could not tell the difference. It was amazing. So there's a huge overlap between trauma and um, substance use disorders. Uh, Glenn Murray, this guy's on fire. He comes back in with why do some people become addicts through frequent drug use and others do not? That's a superb uh, question because the fact is no, no matter how much you might want to grow up and become an addict someday, if you don't have a brain that's, that's wired for, and by that I mean a brain that's capable of releasing great big chunks of dopamine in response to putting the drug in your brain, you're not going to see addict behavior. You're not going to see that hijacking. That's a person who's always going to have more control over the drug than the drug is going to have uh, over them. So you will certainly see some reward um, elicited in, in people that we used to call in the olden days of the dsm 4 that we would call substance abusers. They certainly experience reward from the drugs or else they wouldn't take them. Um, but as the consequences start to build up, if the boss says, hey, I think you've got a problem, your, your job's at jeopardy, or, or your husband or wife is getting ready to kick you out of the house, or the judge says, we've got a problem here. Mm -hmm.
you can either rein back, scale back your substance use to the point where the uh, consequences start to go away, or you can stop substance using altogether. Whereas for the what we used to call opioid dependent, excuse me, substance dependence uh, in the DSM, four days uh, that use keeps going on unabated, regardless of the consequences that are raining down. And uh, the final question from Robert Peters: How do the brains of non-chemical induced addiction, for instance, gambling brains, differ from chemically induced addiction? I can't tell you the, the exact um, pathways, but it probably has an awful lot to do with gene expression. I, I can tell you from, from personal experience uh, doing an auction on eBay near the end of the auction when, when I'm watching the second uh, counter whirling down and I'm bidding and counter bidding against somebody who's, who's come up out of the ether and is bidding against me, my heart gets racing and I'm on top of the world at that moment, just as surely as if I had had a good slug of, of whatever kind of you know drug of choice my brain might be wired for. So once again, an awful lot of of overlap and similarity uh, between the process addictions, brain scans that probably look uh, similar. Somebody who's who's a true uh, food addict, I you put them in a PET scanner and, and you show them a, a picture of the golden arches and their brain is going to light up in an almost indistinguishable fashion from somebody who's a, a cocaine addict in the adjacent mm -hmm. scanner uh, who's just had a crack stem uh, put in their mouth. The, the, the triggers uh, yield very, very similar pictures. Lucinda has a question right here. You can read that. All right, Lucinda. Linda has a question. I'm looking. Scroll up. There we go. Trying to chase out one more question. Asks how are serotonin and dopamine related in addiction, and why does serotonin? Serotonin, of course, being the the main neurotransmitter, at least. In the current way of thinking, um, very much more involved in mood disorders. So, you know, all of the therapy for the most part that we're, we're throwing these days at depression and mood, dis mood disorders are serotonin-based chemicals. Um, so all of the modern antidepressants, you know, Zoloft, Prozac, Alexa, Lexapro, all those things are, are serotonergic, serotonin-building uh, compounds. Um, it's interesting in terms of substance abuse. I mean, there there is a pretty darn popular substance that elicits uh, hellacious um, increases in serotonin in the brain, and that's MDMA or or ecstasy. Um, and it's interesting to note that if you go to a psychiatrist and they you know put you on a serotonin type drug for your depression, they'll tell you, okay, I want you to take this for a month and then come back and we'll talk about if you think it's helping you or not. Whereas uh, if your ecstasy dealer told you, here, I'll sell you the ecstasy this afternoon, go ahead and start taking it, come back in a month and we'll talk about whether it's starting to work or not. Um, you know, they go out of business pretty quick. So MDMA or ecstasy is capable of, of skyrocketing uh, serotonin levels in the brain in very short order. Um, but most of the substances that we think of as, as classically addictive, uh, you know, inspiring uh, tolerance and, and hijacking the brain, um, taking over the brain, all seem to be much more related to, to dopamine and whether or not they're capable of releasing dopamine in that critical mesocortical limbic uh, pathway, which antidepressants do not do. Um, so there are certainly some major differences there. And it sounds like we've got one final question. Oh, Lord. Okay, you all did save the big one for last, didn't you? How do you manage nicotine addiction during treatment? Um, I mean, this is really kind of my thing. It's kind of what, what I've devoted the last several years of my life to. And, I mean, we're certainly extremely schizophrenic at best about tobacco in this in our field, in this industry. Um.
Now, like I mentioned before, deadliest drug on the planet is going to kill more people than all of the other addictions that we treat, even if you pool all the other addictions and you add in car wrecks and house fires and suicides, there are so many more people that are going to willingly yet unconsciously lay their lives down for this drug. And, and we know from the science, from the research, you know, like I said, it's as addictive as heroin, cocaine, alcohol. So we really need to do be, we need to, you know, start taking better care. These people deserve treatment of their tobacco addiction as surely as they deserve treatment of any of their other substance use. And, and I think there's some good data starting to show that if you leave an addiction treatment center and you've put every one of your drugs down except tobacco, you're at something like a 300 to 400% greater risk of relapse back to whatever you consider your drug of choice to be because those critical centers in your brain have never had the chance to fully heal and fully reset. And, and I think people do much better trauma work. They do when they're not self-medicating with anything. Thing, including, you know, breaking in the middle of a therapy group or at the end of the therapy group and all these feelings are starting to come up and you, you stuff them down by um, smoking a cigarette. Um, so how do we treat it? Uh, people can still smoke at our center. I'm, I'm thinking that's probably the case in most addiction treatment facilities on the planet. I certainly do backflips to to let people know that, you know, I would consider an honor if they would include me on a, on a healing uh, journey for tobacco with them. Uh, you know, I will get them through it safely and, and comfortably. Um, you know, there's several medications. There's all forms of nicotine replacement, and I'll use that in as high a dose as it takes for the person not to crave and Jones for a cigarette. I'm, I'm, I'm not that upset about what it says on the package, and I've even... Mm. Pregnant people, I think, are much better off detoxifying from, from tobacco um, and using a medication. Um, I certainly also offer uh, Wellbutrin to people that are appropriate candidates for bupropion. And Chandix is an absolutely amazing drug in 40 or 50 percent of the people that take it. I mean, the common thing I find is that people sit there and say, well, isn't that a dangerous drug? Isn't it risky? And I sort of pinch my fingers together and I say, well, there's probably this much risk from Chandix. And then I spread my arms as wide as I can get them. And I'll say, there's this much risk from tobacco. Um, but, you know, what looks like the better, the better way to go for you in, in terms of risk? Um, so, you know, I offer it. I put it out there, I listen to people, I, I absolutely don't judge their tobacco use, but I do let them know, you know, a little bit about certainly the, the health consequences that it's going to peel 10 to 15 years off the average, you know, woman smoker's life. And you may not care so much, you know, right now, but believe me, when you get into recovery, when you're on that path to self-recovery, you're going to care. And I get that if you're 20 years old, you probably think you're bulletproof and you know, dying at 65 instead of 80 seems like not such a bad deal, but I, I just try to let people know at, at my advanced age of 56, I can see that, you know, every moment, absolutely every moment in this recovering day is precious to me. So kind of the last thing I'd, I'd like to, to leave you with um, is just here at the refuge, um, something I heard Judy Crane say one time. She's the absolutely amazing woman that gave birth to this place that envisioned it and created it and you know put out the energy put out the vibration in in the world that drew the therapist that drew every one of the, the therapists and, and staff people that works here in um, but what she told me and, and I think she actually stole this from her son Tom so but here it goes if we unravel the trauma story if we know where the pain came from, if we understand where the pain comes from, and, and if we unravel that trauma story, then we can begin to understand the addiction story, particularly when you, you know, pour in some of the science and the understanding. So if we unravel the trauma story, then we can understand the addiction story, and only then do we really have a good shot at creating a recovery story. Um, thank you all so much for joining me.